I thank you very much for this invitation to the organizers, and especially uh, Peter, for nominating me for this talk. Um, it's something very, very exciting when I have uh, Amadou with me, because I know that whatever I say, nobody will dare challenge me. He's my bouncer, you know, so. So I'm going to be looking at zoonosis, and I'm going to be looking at the emergence of zoonosis. Uh, how zoonosis have caused rampage in Africa. And then I'm going to be looking at One Health and what it does with zoonosis. At the same time, I'll just make some concluding remarks. Well, what are zoonosis? Uh, as you find by that definition, zoonosis by themselves are a group of virus, uh, a group of, of, of diseases that originally are animal diseases. And then, you know, man gets infected because of his relationship with, with, uh, with animals. There are more than 200 type of pathogens that come out of this. And close to 75% of all the zoonoses that we have today are actually originated from, from animals. And they come from different groups, viruses, bacteria, parasites, uh, and so many other of that kind of uh, diseases. There are at least 70% of these zoonoses are actually vector-borne. And you find virtually every continent of the world has his own or his own type of zoonosis, um, ranging from spread of Africa, we have the Lassa Ebola. Um, and we also have other viruses related to the Lassa in the Americas and in the other sides of the world. In the Asia, you have the SARS and some of the limited viruses, Nipah virus and a few others like that. <clears throat> what are the things that lead to the emergence of uh, of uh, zoonotic diseases. They're quite complex, and they vary from the, the, the human behavior. I think it's one of the most important aspects of it. The world has changed now. There's so much travel. Um, I can be sick in Nigeria today and be in Toronto tomorrow, incubating the disease, just like uh, what the Liberian guy brought the Ebola into Nigeria over a space of just uh, two hours of travel. The, the, the population surges that we're having in different parts of the world, the, 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 um, uh, the, the slums and the large number of people coming to urban centers that are not ready for, for them create some of the issue, issues that we have. People talk about climate change. For example, the, the, with, the, with the change in climate, uh, in the, in, there's increase in temperature. We have more of the vectors surviving for quite a longer time than, than what used to, used to happen. And this is just a, a slide that is a bit difficult to read, but basically just to say that different types of viruses, uh, different types of agents, rodents, bats, apes, monkeys, uh, are involved in the transmission. And when man gets involved with each or any of these, then you end up with zoonotic disease coming into the, uh, into the human population. Or to see the kind of interrelationship that we find with the different types, strains of viruses, and the movement and the activity of people uh, the, the, the relationship that we have, man and animal in the farm, uh, we go into new areas and create new, new, um, new, new developments and mining industries and so many other things. And as you can see that there's so much of interrelationship between man and animal, so we're not living in an environment. Take a good example of what is happening with the, sorry, oops, sorry. Take a good example we about the global influenza, the, the horses, the birds, the pigs, and then man in the center. And because this is a virus that has a series of reassortment with different things, then we get different kinds of uh, influenza viruses. And you can see the way people behave. Below there is a market in Nigeria where you have man and chicken. Uh, I don't know what is happening at the top there, but you can imagine what the kind of things can be happening. Again, you can see it's a very complex situation, arthropods, vertebrates and we meet mixed with the jungle in the urban centers. And we were just discussing over there that some of the viruses which create no problem in parts of Africa suddenly turn and mutate and become something. So the pathogens themselves also make changes. Like for example, chikungunya, we've been isolating chikungunya since the 1920s. We've never had any major problem in Africa, but suddenly it's now becoming a major issue. West Nile, the same thing. And so we begin to see that even the pathogens also participate in all that. And you can see this shows that uh, yellow fever, for example, in, in, in the Americas, when you start noticing deaths of monkeys in the jungle, then you, you're almost sure that you're going to have uh, yellow fever. 
We are swine in Bizidi for Nipah virus, then this epidemics, and so many other situations. West Nile, of course, we talk about Ebola, um, and now uh, next other things. Again, looking at some of that in details, Nipah, Nipa, SARS, Ebola. Man and his environment create the right condition for those infections. So these are the factors. The population changes as we grow and grow large, and a large number of people move into different areas. Uh, and people's behavior also. Uh, migration shifts, wars in Africa, in those other places, move people from one. Every, virtually every country in Africa has had one little problem or the other. Created uh, the, the political situations in Kenya, for example, created the slums of, of Kibar, Kibar, Kibar in, uh, in, in, in Kenya. Uh, and then increase in trade, especially in hides and skins and exotic pets, also are ways in which uh, uh, zoonosis gets into man. Changes in human behavior. AIDS was probably one of those ones. Climate change, we were talking about that. And then when we neglect those public health infrastructures, um, I, was, well, I was really quite touched when uh, Peter said he went back to Yompoku, and the situation is even worse than it was in those days. These are some of the issues. So when we neglect those things, we create problems for ourselves. Africa has had its own series of epidemics and different kind of diseases, name it. You find it virtually every country has one thing or the other which has been happening, plague, yellow fever, Ebola, you know, monkeypox, Marburg, everything you can imagine occur in, the, in those areas. And we see also back in, in, in Africa, you know, when you see, looking at the Ebola epidemic, which uh, we already had information, we've had no less than 25 uh, outbreaks in the Afri African region, and they're still happening. Why is it that since 1976, we, we've not been able to take good care of, of Ebola, for example? You see the situation with the uh, Lassa fever, which is uh, in major country found, found mainly in the west coast of Africa, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and uh, Liberia. The same area where we're having all the people with Ebola, the same situation is what is occurring in those places. And then again, we, we look at River valley fever, which is a disease of veterinary of animals. Humans also get it, but it's mainly a disease of animals, which occur mainly in the eastern part of Africa, uh, occasional cases in, on the west, part, west coast of Africa. That's the Ebola situation in, in retrospect. Over 20, 24, 25 outbreaks in different parts of Africa. But the West African situation has been the one that uh, has been responsible. But we do know, I mean, there's so many reasons that are responsible for that. Now, Ebola is not just a disease. It's not just 11,000 people died. It affects money. Ebola kills, dehumanizes the people. It touches, I mean, it's those who have seen the, the cases, seen the way people behave, you know that Ebola is not just a disease that is killing people. It's actually a humanitarian disaster, as, we, as I've been said. Basic infrastructures, which were fragile to start with, get destroyed by Ebola. And Sierra Leone, I mean, Sierra Leone, we talk about that. We know what is happening in Liberia, same situations. And all sorts of situations then occur. Uh, different kind of chaos come. You know, people are looking for ways and finding ways to get the, the Ebola. Economy is down. I mean, that's on, the, on, the, on, my, on my left side. I'm not too sure which is the pointer here. On, 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 the, on this side, on my right side here, you find in, in normal market day in Freetown. Now what happened when Ebola came into town? Nobody in the streets. And so the, the borders are closed because people don't want to uh, export the disease. Uh, emergency spending goes on health. The, the, the economy of those countries are going to be reversed, and World Bank has said it's going to cost at least three to five billion dollars to get those things back. Those countries can no longer export their products like their cocoa and the palm oil that they usually do. Now, where does One Health come in, into all this? World Health look, I mean, One Health looks at the collaboration effort in which everybody, and we've seen with Ebola, is a very good example of what, what One Health comes into. The social scientists, the veterinarian, the physician, and the community leaders all come together, looking at the situation globally, bringing in all the different talents that each of us has, to, uh, and then consider the transmission of disease, not as a uh, man to them, but as a total environmental uh, uh, situation that requires everybody's, everybody's involvement. Now, One Health encourages strong intersectoral uh, coordination at all levels, and the key is prevention that will lead to joint preparedness and response planning at country level, um, sharing of information between the different relevant groups, 
and then continuous generation and management of knowledge of zoonosis. That's what one, one, one that encourages. But how, how do we make use of One Health? It is, we need to scale, down, scale up our surveillance system. Uh, we'll be talking a little more about that later on. We have to accelerate the IHR. The IHR is the International Health Regulation, which has failed woefully to solve the problem of the world, but I think this needs to be looked into when we talk together as one health group, because like the OIE, or which is the organization that is involved with the animal diseases, has been quite more successful than WHO in terms of reporting of diseases, for example. We need to promote intersectoral uh, collaboration and partnership amongst ourselves and communication. I was just discussing again there with that. Uh, I'm looking at those tweeters. Some people of them are miles away from here and they are participating. In those days, the, the, by the time we know about this conference, it will be a year after the proceedings are out. But now people are talking about what exactly was going on. Communication becomes very important. That can be applied in disease surveillance and other things because we need funding. And that's a, an area we'll quickly talk about later. Now, what do we need to, to do that? We need to sustain the resilient health system in a different country. Many of the health systems are fragile because of years of neglect. And when, when uh, Mali, uh, uh, Senegal, and Nigeria overcame Ebola, it did not require so much sophistication. It was just those basic infrastructures plus a determination of the people to solve the problem. And solving a problem with Ebola, if you need people on the board at places, all the global structures we're talking about may not be that necessary. We need to accelerate the implementation of the IHR because that is the basis for which countries can improve their disease surveillance. And uh, preparedness is a regular thing. Countries are not prepared. We only prepare when the epidemic is about to come. And then I talk about communication and then mention the issue of funding to, to what is happening. Now, to strengthen preparedness, we need to get plans ready ahead of time. And response teams must be, must be established. We must have proper documentation. And then whatever is the stockpile that we require must be strategically managed. When we also looking at that in terms of surveillance, Africa has had an integrated disease surveillance and response since 1997. But it's not functioning because funding has not been provided. Though this, the plans are on ground, nobody is, is, is putting funding into it. And then zoonotic disease must be part, which were not before part of the ideas are in the African region. These are we're learning quite a lot of lessons from what is happening. Um, I need to also look at the fact that, but when you look at, Af one of the greatest failures of the IHR is the fact that it, it is country self-assessed. It's, it's self-assessed by the country. So when Liberia says they have 99% of, of the IHR completed, and then we see Ebola ravage the country. Something is wrong somewhere. And therefore, I think for the IHR monitoring, there must be an independent body that takes care of that rather than countries assessing themselves, which is what is happening with, with currently. Now, quickly, I know I'm glad that the private industry is involved. In many parts of Africa, the, a, lot, a few of the diseases like Lhasa actually come from the mining areas. And I think it is time to get the private people involved. Now that Ebola is occurring, the mining companies cannot even go to their minds. Therefore, it is important for them and for the also people to be involved in what is going on as far as because diseases like Lhasa, Mabo, all originate from some of the mining areas. And these are diseases that affect their industry and it is in their position. And for them to improve the living conditions in, in, the, in the area where their miners are living and get involved with governments and the community in bringing out uh, uh, support for, for, for Ebola. Let me go to my concluding remarks. Usually, my concluding remarks often are the ones that are more potent than whatever it is. You can read about One Health anywhere, but you can't read about what is happening in Africa anywhere. Africa's poverty is not a lack, but it is a misuse of what we have. I think it is important to state that. I'll give two examples. My brother from Senegal is here. They have a monument with the built for with $27 million. That's the monument there, the recognition of Africa. But this is a model, <laughs> and that's the country where this same monument is right on top of a slum, where there's no facilities for the people, no hospitals, nothing of that nature. In my country, 12 of my people ordered jets at the cost of 480 million in 2014, and we are number 166 on the rank of the world's uh, poor countries. Often, external aid benefits the donor more than the recipient. That may be a surprise to you. But in actual fact, you gain more from the aid you give to me than I gain. Uh, let me uh, I'll give you a few examples. 
the pathogens everywhere come ultimately end up with you becoming the expert. The African expert becomes the sample collector because he cannot go further than to collect sample, and that's the end of it. And also, we must get to the point, but that is not your fault. It is the fault of those countries to create a conducive environment for their people to work. And until we get to that, and that was the point that was raised, that it is not a global issue. It is the national issue. If we get the nations working, then we can protect everybody. Until we do that, uh, that's the weakest chain. Until we get those countries to begin to do the things for themselves, we will continue to have epidemics. And I pray that in 10 years' time, we'll not come back here to come and talk about another disease you know, to see what we're going to do about that. Africa has been unlucky to have leaders. Some are less vicious than Ebola. Some are more vicious than Ebola. And you can take your choice from the ones that we have there. In some of the African countries, the children are born when some of the leaders at Zoom office have become grandfathers, and the leaders are still there. Like Ebola, they remain and cause more trouble for our country. Unfortunately, I'm sure there's still some vacant positions in which some African leaders would like to go into. In London, in Paris, in Toronto, we are talking about what next? Where did we go wrong? What can we do? We, too, are asking questions in Africa, but our questions are different from what you're asking. In Conakry, in Freetown, we ask ourselves, ah, compare Ebola to the war of Sierra Leone. Charles Taylor killed 50,000 people. So what was Ebola, 11,000? How much aid did we get, you know? And who has not yet given us aid? And who else is bringing it? And how big is that aid? Those are the questions. But there must be a new deal for Africa. There must be a change. And you are going to help because we are trying to make sure that we get through that one. I want to make a comment about the fact that people talk about WHO. WHO is what it is today because of what the developed countries have done with WHO. When you give WHO extra budgetary fund and tell you to spend it like this, you don't need WHO anymore. There are still countries that need WHO. And until we begin to get the proper, I mean, when you, when you fund it, my first experience of international aid was a meeting in 1988 when we were told that 2.5 million was going to be given to African countries to develop the laboratory. And when it was finally set out, 2 million was to go to consultants and 0.5 million was to go to the labs. And I thought something was wrong, but they told me that's the way they don't want to spend their money. We need to look at those issues. If you want to be, uh, uh, so many of us in, in Africa, we have buried our heads in the sand of complacency and we have refused to talk. We are scared. We don't see, we don't see any evil, but yet evil is all around us. But we refuse to talk because of fear. 75% of African countries have been dependent for the last 60 years. What have they done? What have we done with our independence? And that is the, that is the basis of what we're talking about. It is not what you're doing. We're, everybody's developing. So when you say some, the world is, yeah, yeah, we are developing world. I'm sure you're developing too, because what was in Toronto yesterday is not what it is today. So we're all developing countries. But <laughs> Africa, 75% of Africans have got independence for the last 60 years. You can't blame the colonial powers for what is happening. So Africa future. Whose hand is it? It has to be in the hand of the Africans if we must make a change. Africa must disentangle herself from the current state of decadence. It is time to make a good choice or a bad choice. It is time for us to go the right way. We need assistance, but we don't want dependence, and that's what the thing we need to, to look at. Ebola came devastating and unprepared West Africa, compounding years of misplaced priority. Only time, bringing another epidemic, I hope, will reveal whether we have learned anything or we have forgotten the ones we have learned. Ask that question in one of the papers. Will Africa's future epidemic ride on forgotten lessons from the Ebola epidemic? And I'm also feeling that's what is going to happen. Boy said nothing has changed in one of his greatest albums. If we must prove him wrong, then political correctness is hurting Africa. Diplomacy is ruining the continent. Tell us as it is. It is for the sake of the world, not just for Africa. Because the coming play will come it will arrive at your doorstep before you know what is happening. I want to congratulate Peter for, I want to congratulate you, Peter, for those, you remember those photographs, like that's good van the ground, and for what you have done for humanity. And I see the picture down below, there's a striking resemblance between you and the current president of South Sudan, just like Ebola resembles uh, Mabok. Uh, my time is up, there's no more time to lose. Thank you very much.